Good morning, Tri-Cities. This is Carl Dye with uh, Coffee with Carl. We are honored this morning to have our special guest, Mr. Chris Johnson at AWB. Good morning, Chris. Carl, you'd think after like 400 Zoom calls, I know to have my mute button <laughs> not on mute. So good morning. Well, Chris, I see you're in a different location other than the uh, AWB headquarters. And I know from that tour you gave us uh, back in February, that you have state-of-the-art microphones in that room. And so I think, you know, maybe it's just the different venue that's thrown you off a little bit. So we'll, we'll give uh, you a pass for sure. No IT support, Carl. <laughs> well, Chris, we appreciate your time this morning and joining us. I think um, we're gonna have a good discussion, but uh, since it's Coffee with Carl, we always start this off. I, hopefully you got the, the uh, cliff notes, but we always talk about coffee that we're drinking. And so I'll, I'll start it off, yes. Oh, nice. Well, why don't you kick us off? I see Tokyo. Tokyo, indeed. Washington State is the most trade-driven state of the 50 states. And certainly Tri-Cities has a connection to Japan as well. As you think about uh, whether we send agricultural products to Japan from the Tri-Cities or the role that the National Lab plays uh, in helping them go through natural disasters and other recoveries like Fukushima. But uh, this, this cup comes from our trade mission to Tokyo the last year that we took. We had a great and successful trade mission there. And that's this is made in Tokyo, from Tokyo, and is uh, an untraditional Tokyo coffee cup. What about you? That's awesome. I have, uh, let's see if you can see it or not, but this is a mug that our daughter Hattie made after she and her mom took a special trip to Disneyland a few years ago. So she created this wonderful um, painting and we had to memorialize it in a coffee cup. So I am drinking some Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse coffee this morning. Very cool. Chris, um, I, I, uh, I guess I've known you for a couple of years now. Um, in my previous position, we were members of AWB and I was able to go to a really excellent rural job summit that you put on down in Longview a couple of years ago. And I, I know your background, but could you just fill the, our viewers in um, this morning? Just tell us a little bit about yourself. And I do want to remind everybody, as we go through this discussion this morning, we will be using the question and answer panel here on Zoom. So if you have any questions for Chris uh, that we could get into, please use the question and answer. Uh, the spirit of the questions, Carl, it's a Friday going into Memorial Day weekend. We like <laughs> softballs this morning. We like softballs. Softballs only. They will be moderated questions. Questions, Chris. Uh, we don't have any Zoom. Well, what's unfortunate is I can't see who's all on the Zoom call here. And so uh, I don't, if I hit the participant button, will I be able to see that? I'm. Give it a try. Yeah. Good question. Uh, oh, yeah, I can kind of see that, but uh, it blocks yeah. me seeing you if I do that. So I got to get out of here. Let me get back to where if we you, were. Uh, if you hit attendees and then over on the right, uh, there's panelists and attendees and click on the attendees box. It'll give you a list. There we go. Yeah, it's working. Uh, okay. A number of things. You, you talked about rural vitality. Let me just spend 30 seconds on why we why we started working on that a couple of years ago. Uh, this is all, obviously all changed in the landscape since COVID, but pre-COVID, the state was on track to grow a million people by 2030 and two million people by 2040. And I think the question a lot of counties were having is, hey, how do I have an opportunity for our region to get our shared prosperity in that growth? And so uh, what is the plan for the Benton Franklin County region? What's the plan for Southwest Washington or the peninsula to say, how do we too get our share of that growth as the state grows, whether it's an economic growth and activity, residential growth and activity, trade growth and activity as well. And, th and that was the purpose for us to call that together because we felt rural Washington was really getting left behind in that conversation. And to our surprise, people really showed up. There's a lot of passion about rural Washington then. And you know what, I think that passion is gonna be even stronger now. I think there will be, uh, in the signs that we're already hearing from, whether it's site selectors calling us or not, they're looking for non for non-urban areas, maybe suburban areas or, or tier two and tier three type of cities as opportunities to put an investment down and whether it's a manufacturing plant, whether it's a, a, a division, whether it's just five to 10 people at. And, and I think rural Washington has a lot to sell on a positive aspect right now. And, and one of the things that came out of it though is the biggest challenge to doing that in rural areas is rural broadband. And uh, that, that's the reason why we will be partnering with Commerce later this fall to do a rural broadband, rural vitality uh, event is because the, the, the piece of infrastructure that's needed to move us 
uh, and the next generation economy will be real broadband. It will be like what the telephone was or electrical wires were to our homes from 100 years ago. It is that important of a utility. And so that's why we got into this space uh, I uh, run the rural jobs conversations a couple of years ago. And it was that's how people like you raised your hand and said, hey, that's really important to my region. Uh, we, we too want to be a part of growing our communities, uh, but we know that we need some tools to help do that along the way. Oh, that's great. Well, that's exciting to hear um, about the work coming up on rural broadband. I know, uh, you know, there's a group of ports here in Washington that have really been leaders on this and have some innovative models. And I'm sure that there are AWB members and they'll be joining you in that conversation. They've got a lot to to add to it and they're probably a good base to build off of. That's awesome. Um, you know, how about Chris, can you uh, talk a little bit about what you see as the state's uh, reaction to and position in, in COVID from a business perspective? And obviously as AWB president, you guys have been leading the charge on representing all of us uh, in Olympia and on some of these statewide initiatives, but What's your general overall sense on how's it going? And can you talk a little bit about maybe these next steps coming up? Yeah, uh, this is an unprecedented time. You know, we, we talk about ac acronym soup has not left us, by the way. We talk about things like PPE and PPP and CARES Act. Uh, and, and all of that was foreign to our vocabulary six months ago uh, before we got into this environment. It is a stressful, trying time right now across the state of Washington on so many levels. Uh, we've broken our work scope at AWB into three phases. One was the crisis. Hey, what is happening? What, what, uh, when's it coming to my part of the state? What do we need to do to get ready for it? The next phase was around, and I think we're through the crisis phase and nearing, uh, and, and really solidly in the next phase, which is reopening. How do we get as many companies reopened uh, and get the economy back and working, knowing that you know already today, 14% uh, of the state uh, we have a 14 and a half percent unemployment rate in the state. A million plus people have applied for unemployment benefits and thousands of businesses are closed to comply with uh, the stay, home, stay at home, stay safe order. And some of those aren't going to come back uh, along the way. So each of these are really important phases. So in the rebound phase, you know, Solomon, I get to make breaking news, but let alone breaking news uh, in the Tri-Cities. But 15 minutes ago, we just approved uh, a portal that will go live uh, this weekend called reboundandrecovery.org. So again, if someone's writing this down, it's rebound, like rebounding a basketball, the word and recovery.org. It will have two critical elements. And we've had a 17 person task force meeting uh, over the last three weeks on this, on this important work that we were launching today with the goal of how do we get as many businesses open as safely as possible, as quickly as possible? So there's two elements to this that we approved today that will go live this weekend. One is we need to give, we need to give small business and main street business a toolkit of what do they need to do to return to work. And, and we know that we're going to have to give safety both to our, to our employees, but also to our customers when they come into our environment. So on the toolkit phase, it's everything from, Little, literally print off stickers that you can put six foot mark, mask, uh, masking tape and these stickers on your ground. It's what's your hand washing protocols? What's your customer protocols and all? You'll find all these toolkits. So it's not just the protocols, but the toolkits of literally print off at your printer and put them to work for your individual company online, along with something that we're really excited about, which is PP&E. We have created a PPE portal or what I would call a made in Washington PPE portal that says whether you need five masks, 50 masks or 5,000 masks that you can go onto this portal and list uh, and check what types of PPE you need from hand sanitizers, thermometers, gloves, gowns, masks, et cetera. And you will be matched up with made in Washington PPE by Washington companies and be able to buy masks and gloves and hand sanitizers from Washington companies. Wow. Why is that important? Because it keeps Washington businesses open and working. It keeps men and women earning a paycheck. And that means they're not on the unemployment line and they're part about the recovery plan. And so I'm really, really proud of the hard work of our volunteers, the hard work of our teams to say, we're going to give businesses two really critical things, a toolkit on how to reopen. And it's specifically tailored to small and medium sized businesses and a PPE portal that says, I know it's going to be, PPE is going to be part of our everyday lives until there's a vaccine here. So you can give, do your part to help your local economy by 
purchasing PPE and purchasing it from made in Washington companies. That's great. Well, we've already got a question. Might as well go into that because we just talked about rural broadband, but uh, we've got a, a question about in the work that you see coming up, working with Department of Commerce to focus on rural broadband, um, private telecom companies. Do you, obviously, I'm sure they're AWB members, but is that part of the equation? Um, I, I think the, the question relates to, you know, in the past, it's it's been a challenge for public entities. And I think that public-private split on broadband, you know, whether it's dark fiber or backhaul or th those type of things, what do you see playing out on that public-private split or options? Or, or is it too early to tell? You kind of need to dig into it with commerce or? Yeah, I think that, you know, as, we, as we've talked with commerce, I think we're agnostic about how we get there and, and, and what tool is best to get us there. I think the question is framing up there. If you go, for example, and you look at the, some of the maps that are out there on FCC coverage today, that they're not an accurate reflection of where there is consistent, strong, reliable rural broadband. And so one is getting a, a handle on it. The state's about to release a contract on that regard to go out and get a firm to set firm kind of map of the state of where is there strong broadband and where isn't there. By the way, this is not just a rural problem. There are many urban areas in our state that have pretty poor broad, pretty poor broadband. And so uh, this is to get after, you know, what is, what is the problem statement on broadband? And then what are the solutions? And there's a myriad of solutions out there uh, to, to get broadband to the last mile. I think if I think about what Congress is going to do around a federal infrastructure package, what the state can do in its, in its regard here, I think we've got to take and do the last mile, the last hundred yards, the last feet, and, and get this broadband issue solved. It's going to be critically important uh, for our state. And as we think about the future of healthcare, and I'll think about in this COVID environment, how much telehealth is being done. You've got to have a strong broadband connection to do that. And if you're in rural parts of the state, uh, and if you don't have rural broadband, you can't go and access that rebound and recovery website I just shared with you. And you can't download the toolkit to help your business uh, reopen. You can't get connected and purchase PP&E. So rural broadband is, a, is an important issue for our state. You bet. Um, so just in, in what you said, the, the, I think that's great, the three phases that you guys have split it into. You and I talked a, a while ago and, and you know we've tried to talk in some of those same terms. That's a great template for the rest of us to uh, to kind of learn from what you guys are going through. But um, the last recession that the country faced, you know, um, with the financial crisis that kind of started in 2007, I think you might have been back in Minnesota at that time. And then I think from what your bio said, anyway, 2010 went, came back to AWB. But what do you see as a comparison contrast from your perspective, uh, you know, in these leadership positions that you've held in the previous like recession that was a recession and then this one, which obviously there's an economic impact because of the COVID, but can you talk a little bit about that and what you see as differences or maybe some similarities from that perspective? Yeah, you know, I'm often asked, as I'm sure you are, is what's an analogy for this environment? My, my best analogy is it's 9-11 and the fact that it's gonna have huge impacts on our economy. I think pre, pre going into COVID, I think when we thought this was gonna be a V shape, hey, we're gonna nosedive down and nosedive up, there'd be no change in workforce, there'd be no change in habits and all. That isn't what our experience is gonna be. I, I think our experience is gonna be kind of a swoosh, like pretty deep dive and an incremental come out of this. So 9-11 and its disruption, disruptive uh, impacts on our economy. And I don't think we're through this yet because my other analogy is it's 9-11 plus the movie Groundhog Day. We wake up every day and we're still in this. Unlike 9-11, where we woke up on 9-12 and started to say, so uh, how impacted is our economy? How impacted is our transportation and infrastructure system? We don't know that yet because we're still operating in the crisis here. And so, uh, you know, Ryan Gretzky always says, skate to where the puck is going to be, not where you want it to be. Well, we don't quite know where the puck is going to be and what the impacts will have on our everyday lives from PP&E to think about how we've transitioned to working at home in this environment, boy, if broadband is not an important element of working from home. Uh, I think employers, some of them even maybe surprisingly have been surprised about how, how successful and how, how productive their employees have been in this transition. At least I know on our team, our team hasn't missed a beat. They're working as hard as they've ever had, if not harder, and they're doing it from home 
and they're having to balance things, right? You're balancing being a mom and dad. That means you've got to be the teachers at home right now. You might have a, a, a parent or a third generation family member living with you. So we're doing it with a lot more in front of us today. But this is going to be disruptive. Uh, think about this, that the state budget already has a projected $7 billion budget deficit uh, for when the legislators come back next year. And that nearly 50% of the state legislature wasn't around during the last financial crisis. So this is, this is going to be a really, really big challenge for the state. And, and in a time where there's few economic sectors performing well, there, there are businesses, there are some businesses doing well in this environment, but there's no single industry uh, that's doing well. And then think about how important hospitality and tourism is to every community across the state. That's an industry that's been really hard hit. Most small businesses on Main Street, really hard hit. And as you talked about 08 setup, the one sector that did pull us through as a state through the 08 uh, recession was manufacturing. Well, that's a sector that's actually under a fair amount of pressure today. Uh, one and two, only essential manufacturing is open today. So uh, you may be, and, and that's not, we're not calling it that. That's how the state identifies essential or non-essential manufacturers. We think all of essential, all of manufacturers are essential. And if they can meet the safety guidelines and meet the health guidelines, uh, they ought to be up and opening. So you'll hear us use a tagline of, we think you should go to work and then go home. Go to your work where it's clean thoroughly, sanitize thoroughly, do the important work you need to do, and then go home. That's great. We got another question for you. I think that corresponds to what you're just um, talking about. Chris. So the, the question is, is healthcare um, as it relates, and you described working from home and you know, having to balance actually your family because you're all at home and, and that. So as we come out of this, based on when the schools could open or even um, the childcare industry, which I, I think fall into the small business category that have been closed down. And I know because we worked with Department of Commerce on these small business grants, we saw many of those local companies that have been severely impacted and some have even had to yeah. close in that time frame. But do you have any thoughts on that uh, childcare and then education recovery uh, coming out of this and, and what are some of those implications going to be? Yeah, on the child care piece, I would say we, we've been doing a lot of work in this the last 18 months around child care deserts in our states, the parts mm -hmm. of the states that don't have access to, to child care centers. And it becomes uh, an issue again in rural areas. If you're in a rural area and you maybe only have one or two child care centers and they close down, there's huge impact. So right now, the number one issue we hear from employers when they say they're when their employees say, I can't return to work is because with schools closed, they don't have a child care option for their children right now. Uh, this is this is a really important issue on our rebound and recovery task force is a woman who leads child care centers and she will talk about the, the challenges she has on with getting her workforce in with being able to stay open during this really difficult period of time uh, and then just talking about some of the, the costs and challenges around operating child care facilities uh, i think we don't know what this looks like at the end of the day because you know if, if there's a Without a vaccine, if we see an uptick in the fall again, are we going to be doing school from home again and doing virtual school days? Uh, I, I joke to my kids, there's no such thing as a snow day in the future, man. You're going to be on your computer doing Zoom calls all day long, just like you and I are doing for work. No right. more play days when there's a snow day. That's right. No, that's uh, exactly right. I, I would say on the workforce front, we just happen to be doing something really timely. And I don't know if Sandra, Chancellor Haynes, or... Uh, Rebecca Woods are on our uh, on your Zoom call this morning, but we're going to do a pilot in the Tri Cities in twenty this fall on a workforce portal that we're launching. We're doing a uh, two pilots, one in Spokane and one in the Tri Cities, which is bringing a workforce portal to the region it, for internships, externships, apprenticeship programs, youth apprenticeship programs, a, a really robust workforce portal. Because I think we are going to spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, workforce opportunities, access to skills and training. And, and I couldn't be more pleased with the partnership that we're going to have with WSU and CBC and our local employer partners in the Tri-Cities like PNNL to pilot this portal, uh, again, to give uh, employers an opportunity to, to develop the next generation of workforce that they're going to need really soon because of the mass amount of retirements that we're already seeing and we were already seeing today. Oh, that's great. Um, 
Chancellor Haynes actually is on. She said she's so excited in the question and answer box. And she was actually, uh, she made a comment about Microsoft contributing to the Rural Broadband Initiative. So we appreciate her support. And that's exciting that uh, WSU Tri-Cities uh, will be one of those pilot sites. And that sounds like a great program. I'd love to tell you I'm making, this is a, an inside joke and she will get it. I'd love to tell you that I'm making breaking news today on that announcement, but I think somebody else announced this on a panel you moderated uh, your very first week on the job back at the economic symposium uh, early in March. No, totally. And Rebecca's on as well. And she said she's also from CBC looking forward to working with AWB and WSU Tri-Cities. And that, that's that's great thing about me being new here to the Tri-Cities. We have uh, such a strong post-secondary uh, education system. And I'm looking forward just even to learning more about what we have because I am so new on the job for sure. I think, you know, workforce is going to be the key sectors that are going to help uh, empower regions to grow. If you have a skilled, trained, educated workforce, if you have pathways for young people uh, to get exposed to career opportunities early, and then you have a system that's aligned to local employer needs, uh, I think the Tri-Cities is really well poised to come out of this stronger uh, with, with a skilled, trained workforce. Yeah, you know, um, that brings up a great point. It's one of the things, as I was uh, going through the process to be selected for this job, uh, you know, Chris, I got to give you a shout out because you were uh, very helpful for me with your background in the Tri-Cities and, and just helped me get some some basis. But you you taught me about how the economy in the Tri-Cities is set up, you know, and where we do have these institutions like PNNL and then obviously the ongoing Hanford um, cleanup costs. But, you know, that where that that federal sector, which is a big part of our the base of our economy, has been paid even through the shutdown. We anticipate coming out of this that because those dollars are still in our community that hopefully we're hoping we don't know yet because we haven't reopened but that there will be some pent-up demand that can drive some of our local economic uh, recovery especially in those secondary markets that you talk about you know from hospitality to food service and some of those other ones so we're hopeful but we really appreciate your partnership and learning from what you're doing at the state level and how it can roll out here locally so that's a great partnership we appreciate well i i have to think that a big section of the recovery bill that Congress will work on will be around a number of things, innovation and technology, manufacturing, uh, basic infrastructure and all. I think the Tri-Cities is uniquely positioned to play strongly in that regard, whether it's support of the National Lab, whether it's support of, of, of our energy and electricity system here, or our roads and transportation system in that regard. I think the Tri-Cities is poised if, uh, if it has a regional plan together to be really strong in this approach and to equip our federal policymakers to say, hey, we have a plan. Uh, and it, as you think about devising that budget, here are things that could be done in the mid-Columbia uh, that can move some projects along that have been waiting to go. Oh, you bet. That brings up a point. I think I just read an article about it this morning, but you know, one of the anticipated changes coming out of COVID is that you talked about it, but this disbursement from the highly dense urban areas you know, I guess both from a, a infectious disease standpoint, but then also from a, uh, you know, if you're out in the suburbs or rural areas, uh, there's a different impact from diseases, but then also these opportunities that you're talking about. Do you see, you know, now being on the west side, do you see any indications that that might be the case, you know, out of that, uh, you know, downtown Puget Sound core and kind of dispersing either from a business point of view or just like individual workers, as many companies announce hey, you can work from home forever. Do you see that that's a trend that might be happening or, or do you see any indicators there? Certainly the ability to be, you know, what strategies around business continuity? Hey, you know, having a second location is always helpful or, or an additional location is always helpful. We can be your Eastern Washington location. We can be your non-urban uh, location. It's certainly an opportunity there. Uh, I do think as we think about, uh, one of the challenges here that's happened in Central Puget Sound, which has caused some of this positive growth to rural areas and state, think Ellensburg specifically has been around housing affordability. Mm -hmm. I don't see the housing affordability issue changing a lot. I think there's still a challenge of uh, limited number of, uh, of house, housing available. And I think employers are, or you know, we as customers are choosing where we wanna work and live first. Uh, and housing is gonna be an important issue on that. Housing and education are gonna be really important there. Tri-City has very affordable housing by and large, has great schools. Uh, I would think that you're uniquely positioned because you're not landlocked like some of the urban centers are to say, you know, 
you can afford a really nice three bedroom, two bath house in our marketplace at fill in the blank. And because you have amazing air service, you, you can be nearly to three quarters of the country nonstop. Think Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, Salt Lake, Minneapolis. I'm sure you've added other service I'm not catching on to, but, uh, or one stop and you're anywhere in the country. Oh, totally. So I, I think the, uh, uh, I think there you were seeing already on the on the northern end of the peninsula places like Bremerton start to see to take off their housing values take off because with the fast ferry there you could be in downtown Seattle in 45 minutes so you can have a great home in Bremerton in a great school system catch the fast ferry to Seattle and be there faster than I could drive it from either Olympia or South Tacoma into Seattle for example that's great. Well, that's a great example that you know there's Bremerton which is traditionally this uh, military shipyard town that's seen those changes based on this, this trend, even before COVID that's coming out. Um, how about Chris and I, I know AWE is very much um, involved with the manufacturing here in Idaho and oh man, Idaho, Washington. Sorry, sometimes I gotta tell you last week we had the health district on. I used to be a county commissioner a long time ago in a place called Bonner County in Idaho. And I called it like Bonner County Health District. So this is two in a row that I'm sure the team's gonna you know be, be tracking my errors, but uh, here in Washington, <laughs> <laughs> what do you see from our manufacturing base as far as changes in the supply chain? You know, we've talked a, a little bit about, um, you know, just in time, obviously lean manufacturing have driven short um, inventories. And I think we've seen that effect in PPE. Obviously you guys have been mm -hmm. working to change that, but then do you see any onshoring trends, you know, back in the Washingtons that, that, that could be great opportunities throughout the state and especially for us here in the Tri-Cities? Yeah, I can share that, the, that there are other regions in this state thinking there's a huge opportunity here to look at supply chains and to say, hey, you know, we have great infrastructure, great, you have two railroad systems, you have great roads and bridges, You're, you can be equally connected to east and west, the north and south. But I think you will see a number of regions look at, hey, what are the major industries in their region? Who's their vertically integrated supplier community? And do they have an opportunity to go after and, and bring that supply community either onshore or if it's already onshore, closer to who the customer is? And so I, I do think that the regions that have good bandwidth have ready to go industrial land availability, that have good office space and affordable housing I think those are going to be some of the key elements to driving economic activity going forward. And knowing what the assets are of the Tri-Cities, I would say, again, I, 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 would, I would think places like Spokane and Tri-Cities and Vancouver, Washington and the peninsula have a huge opportunity for growth, not just, not just net migration in, inside the state, but attraction of new, new businesses and new residential growth uh, to communities with, that have those strong attributes. Oh, that's great. Um, we've got a By question. the way, I will tell you a quick funny since you went there on Idaho there. My, I, I leave the Tri-Cities. I go to St. Paul, Minnesota. And at the very first event, uh, the title sponsor is, is a tribe. And I, I read it like it looked on the sheet of paper. Oh, I want to thank Millie Lax, not the Malak band of the Ojibwe. And I just butchered <laughs> it. Uh, we enjoyed, we, we, I, we had a lot of fun about that for a couple of years. That's good. Well, I guess, uh, you know, there's something about being open and just being real and, and human, right? It's, That's it's right. Hard. So uh, we do have a question from uh, Facebook, from the Facebook live feed. Uh, are you part of or aware of any efforts to push for additional legislation and aid that targets small business needs that were not addressed by the CARES Act in general, like PPP or IDLE or anything? Any federal movement? Are you guys involved in that, as the question looks like? I missed the front part of this. Could, could you just repeat that? Yeah. Um, are you part of or aware of any efforts to push for additional like new legislation federally uh, that targets small business needs that weren't well addressed from the first two CARES Act? Yeah, great. So we have been working closely with the delegation to ensure that we can get as many tools and resources down to the ground to small business as possible. There was a lot of frustration with that first wave of the CARE Act. The money disappeared almost overnight, right? which required Congress to appropriate another round of it. You know, as I look at it, what Congress was basically approving was about a 30 to 45 day support for small businesses. Well, we're gonna come out of that period here fairly soon. So I think the broader question is, is, and I think 
the House acted on a House Democrat proposal maybe last this week that's fairly large. Uh, is there going to be another round of support for small business? And if so, what does that look like? Uh, there were programs like the EIDL, the Economic Injury Assistance Program, that was really important for small business, along with the PPP, you know, uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program as, as well. My guts is they're gonna have to do something else along the way. Uh, that's another bridge step here for small business and to deploy as many resources down to the ground level as possible. Uh, it is interesting to hear the story, even of our own members about who was successful in getting them access to PP, whether it was a bank or a credit union or a non-traditional financing uh, arm as well. But, but no doubt, I think small business has really struggled uh, throughout this period of time and really as we think about rebuilding the economy, we're going to need to do it from Main Street back up. That's a great point. Well, um, maybe another related question. <clears throat> the uh, state through Department of Commerce, uh, through part of the CARES Act, coronavirus relief funds for local governments, uh, they created some program guidelines. They're trying to push out some of the CARES Act money to local municipalities. And there's been some com conversations going on here locally, and then I'm sure you're aware of them statewide too, about how to structure what some small business relief uh, could look like. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or are, are you guys involved in any? And obviously this uh, comes down to individual, you know, uh, local government, county and cities, but any thoughts or involvement with that one, Chris? You, you know, we've had some initial conversation about what the role of the state can do versus what the role of the federal can do. No doubt in recovery phase, the Fed, the feds are going to be the drivers here, right? If they pass an infrastructure package, uh, they, they can do some big things. The state can too. Think about capital budget, think about transportation dollars relative to the recovery phase. But on the helpful phase, you know, th there's a number of things the state could do. None of them are without consequences uh, relative to the state budget, but whether it's lower the BNO rate, uh, but, you know, I think you can find us, our, you know, uh, advocating for a 0% BNO rate for companies that have turned around to make the PP&E, for example, for a couple of years? Or do you give small businesses some, some help along the way, which we think they do need some help, both on the regulatory front and on the, and on the tax front to help them get through this? We're gonna to have to do everything at restarting this economy. We're gonna to have to throw everything in the kitchen sink at restarting the economy because it's been, in some, in some sectors and in some regions, completely closed down. And so this is gonna be a time that requires us to, to not waste the crisis and think big about how do we give confidence to and help the private sector return to work? How do we give them more tools, not less tools to hire employees, to build new products, to, to get their companies going again? And then we need to help rebuild communities along the way. Uh, you know, and, and I think about community events around the Tri-Cities and think about how many of them have great companies that are helping make those happen. And so we, we've got to re help restart the economy. We've got to give certainty to employees that they have a good job and that make good products. And we've got to help rebuild the, the communities we all call home as well. You bet. Well, here's, uh, uh, she's describing it as an easy question. So, uh, and it kind of relates to what we just talked about. But given the challenges the state is facing, what are your thoughts about the next legislative cycle? And I think you talked a little bit about that, but any, uh, maybe insights or ideas about a special legislative session, you know, do we need one, you know, say in the next coming months to try to address some of these budget shortfalls the state's going to face? And then beyond what you just said, any other thoughts about the direction of that legislature in the future? Yeah, a variety of opinions about when the legislature comes back. Uh, some view that they should come back right away and take some actions because every action you take, you take now uh, really lessens what you have to take in next spring when you cut or next January when the legislature comes back relative to, to cuts. Uh, the governor has asked his, has his agencies to do 15% reduction plans in there. Uh, or, or remind the state's facing a $7 billion budget deficit, but the budget's also grown $20 billion in the last 10 years as well. And so there's going to be this conversation about how do you right size the budget? You, you asked a question earlier about the 08 financial crisis. Interesting then, in the 08 financial crisis, we didn't come back into a special session. They actually waited until January, until the normal session was here. And then they passed a budget that was a, a no new revenue budget. It said, hey, I don't think we can go to Washingtonians and ask them to pay more when so many of them are unemployed or so many of the businesses are closed. And 
I think the legislature is going to have to do like you and I have done and say, okay, how do we reduce our family expenses right now? There's not more money coming in. And so how do we live within our means? I, I think that's going to be a hard conversation, but it's going to be an important conversation uh, along the way. And that means some things that are really important don't get done. I, just like there's some really important things I'd like to buy for our family that we're just not going to be able to buy right now. Uh, and so I think the legislature is going to have to have some, some tough conversations in that regard uh, along the way. And, and we're talking about that only from the current effort. If there's another round of this virus and we have further impacts, the $7 billion number might be a double digit based number here along the way. Yeah. Uh, Chris, AWB has been really active, uh, obviously, in our agriculture section. You talked about it when you first started about the exporting um, and even your Tokyo mug related to that. Uh, but what are you, what are, what's your sense from, uh, you know, some of our, our your egg uh, members? Are, what are the effects, especially on, you know, here in uh, mid-Columbia Tri-Cities, we have this very intensive labor, labor sector in our agriculture that, you know, if you get into the plus or something, you don't see. But do you have a sense of, of the impacts on agriculture and then, you know, how are ag producers dealing with it? Uh, yeah, you know, agriculture by itself is our, our really, you know, one of our top three uh, sectors of the state's economy, both employment and in trade perspective. I, I'm really nervous in, for this sector. You hear the stories about potato farmers in the northern part of the basin who are, who, who are doing the right thing, which is give the potatoes away to anybody who can use them or, or farmers plowing potatoes under or to know, you know, speaking of this Tokyo Cup, we're going into cherry season. Where do the majority of Washington grown cherries, which are the best in the world, go to? Primarily Asia uh, uh, along the way. What is our apple crop season going to look like? What's our hop season going to look like? Uh, I think sometimes we forget that we are number one in 10 different major and minor commodities as a state. Uh, we ship a lot of that. We export a lot of that to foreign countries uh, to enjoy along the way. And so there's some real big uncertainty about what, what's going to be able to ex be exported and, and to where. And then secondly, uh, some of our wheat farmers just got left out in the federal bill that just passed Congress. And so mm -hmm. some of our Eastern Washington wheat growers are really concerned about, hey, we don't see the same type of relief coming to this sector that maybe some other sectors got. And so I do know there's some effort uh, with our delegation to take care of, uh, of wheat. A, a reminder, speaking of Tokyo, 90% of the wheat we grow is soft white wheat. It goes to Asia to be used in noodles and, and, and other pieces. And so, you know, I'm reminded that the economy is a system. We're all connected to that system. And, you know, milk does not come from Safeway. It comes from a cow who's got to get milk, who's got to get processed, it's got to then get bottled, it's got to get trucked to a grow to a distribution center, then to a grocery store so you and I can pick it up, and then we can bring it home. We are a fully integrated supply chain and agriculture is a huge piece of that. And every time I, I go to Chick-fil-A and have a cross cut French fry, I know that came from a plant in the Tri-Cities and I know that all of Chick-fil-A's French fries comes from back home. That's great, that's great analogy. So I might open you up for one more softball. Um, your name starts with a K, as does mine, and as as you know, common K names. What's your what's your uh, is there a family story on on your name, Christopher? And I bring that up because I I have one brother. His name is also Chris, but it's Christian, and that's with a K and a J. So, you want to give any perspective on unique names that start with K? Yeah, mine's Christopher, and it's also not P H. It's O F E R. So K R I S T O F E R. So just like Christian spoke a little bit differently, Alar. I know there's probably another Carl listening. I'm sorry he doesn't spell his name the right way. Uh, <laughs> I, I happen to spell mine with a K, so I'm pretty happy with that. I'm thankful that he hasn't thrown any softballs or tomatoes at me today too hard. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure that now will show up in the Q&A field here in a few minutes, and we'll have to banner about that. But I, I love the way how you spell it, Carl. The, uh you know, this, the K's got to stick together, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> so what about, uh, you know, maybe moving into the third part of the way you've described, um, you know, what we're going through, but like recovery and, and like new normals. What, what do you see in new normals? And I think, you know, at AWB, you know, to a certain extent, like what we do or other business organizations here in the Tri-Cities throughout the country, you know, a lot of what we do is, um, Put on events sometimes and have face-to-face -face meetings and so 
you know, can you talk about like business in general, like new normals or what do you see coming out of this? And then, you know, maybe uh, on the business organization, like from an AWB perspective, what are you guys looking at or what are you anticipating as, as we move forward? Yeah, you know, maybe a couple, three things to think about, Carl. One is, uh, I'd ask everyone that's on this Zoom call to think about this for a minute. Think about how many miles you would normally drive in a month. So for me, it would be about 2,000. In March, it went to 700. And in April, I drove 282 miles. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. No. So completely disruptive in how we commute. Uh, my neighbor bought a brand new car. He, he was joking. He doesn't even have like 300 miles on it. He hasn't had a reason to drive or jump in there. Uh, so, you know, I think this is goes back to this is 9-11 and Groundhog Day. Right. We're not sure yeah. what this is going to be. When's the last time we've gone to the movie theater? Yeah. I mean, anyone who knows me knows I'm a huge college basketball fan. I had eight tickets for the, the games in the Spokane Arena. It just killed me that the NCAA tournament didn't happen. You know, uh, think about the next time when we're going to go to a major sporting event or an activity. Uh, we as we as associations put on a lot of events and part of the value is to connect and network along the way. You're smiling. There must be something in the Q&A field that came through. That's good. Uh, I look forward yes. to hearing about that. Uh, I think the nature of us meeting, uh, you know, Zoom calls were really exciting at the beginning. You know, I'm not so excited about doing Zoom. I mean, I love this Zoom call. This is great. I don't want you to hear that. But I mean, you know, oh, three Zoom calls today or 20 meetings this week. Or, uh, but it's also work. And I, I didn't answer this part when you asked the question earlier. I've been really impressed how many companies have said, you know what, we were able uh, to successfully transition our companies to working remotely. And we've been really pleased with the results that we're seeing. And, and one of, one of my uh, medium sized companies said, you know, we're known for buying nice chunks of land, building a good sized building on there and having all of our employees come into there. This may change our corporate real estate strategy in the future. We may, we may say, Hey, only 300 of the 700 need to come in on a regular basis. And the rest can work from home, either remotely full-time or remotely part-time or, at all and you know my joke about no more no more snow days for our kids i mean what this has proven is we have the ability to be productive in this environment uh and then i think for organizations like ours it, our, if our mission has never been more important today if, if not advocating on behalf of our you know six thousand members has never been more important if not us whom and if not leading in this COVID environment then when and I am so proud. I almost get choked. I was so proud of how our team has led. And they're doing it, having to raise kids at homes and maybe poor internet and lots of distractions. And they're getting it done. They're getting it done at an amazing level uh, along the way. So I, you know, it's, this is an opportunity for organizations like Tritech and us to lead. And if not us whom, and if we're not going to lead in this very difficult period of time, then when are we going to lead? That's great. And well said. Thank you. So the, the reason I was smiling about the quest, question was uh, from the, I think the Carl in question, <laughs> he said he remained quiet, but since uh, you brought it up based on the Chris, Chris's long history with Tridec, who is his favorite Carl? <laughs> You're breaking up. What'd you say? <laughs> it's that poor internet. <laughs> you know, here's, here's maybe a broader question, Carl. You and I, by the way, grit fashion, we're both wearing boots today. We're both wearing dress shirts. I wonder if Carl's sitting there in his Tommy Bahama uh, shorts <laughs> and whether it's a coffee or a Manhattan or a Bloody Mary. That, that, that Actually, Carl, Adrian, could you let us know what you're drinking this morning? I'd, I'd love to see that come back through in the Q&A feed here this morning. <laughs> well, I think no matter what he's uh, wearing or drinking, you and I are both jealous <laughs> of his position uh, for sure. He's, he's uh, I'm sure, enjoying the next phase of his life. A uh, couple more questions we got coming in. Uh, there's a question about phase four businesses. So I think some of those that are like large event gatherings, you talked about college basketball. And of course, um, you know, all the Cougars, including the chancellor uh, are excited about Cougar football this, this fall. And I'm sure the Huskies are too. So um, any discussions or considerations about uh, phase four and are you hearing anything like when you guys talk to the governor's office in the state and thoughts about that? You know, I think uh, it's a great question. 
I, you know, I think phase four is the last phase. And I think we're all looking forward to how do we get, how and when do we get to phase four and how do we re, you know, return to normal as I use quotes here. The, the pressure right now is how do we get to phase two and how do we get every county to phase two right now, which is a really important step. And, you know, 10 counties have gotten the green light to go to phase two. I think today, actually, I think it's already broke. So I think at 930 this morning, Spokane announced that they did receive their waiver. Spokane County will go to phase two. That's really important for a lot of different re reasons. It's Eastern Washington's largest employment cluster, one, two. It's the regional hub for a lot of different things, just like Tri-Cities is a regional hub. But uh, there is this pent up demand to uh, how do we get businesses back open? How do we get small business and Main Street back open so that you and I can go shop and, and visit there? But but we got to do it with health and safety in mind. Uh, and we're going to have this balance of health and safety and the economy as we go forward. But I think we all are looking forward to the day when we can go to a movie theater or go to a Mariner game or go to a Cougar game. Uh, but I, uh, but I, there haven't been a lot of attention on phase four as we're just trying to get to phase two right now, to be honest with you. If, if you follow the cycles as the governor laid them out, I think we get to phase four right around maybe Labor Day. Labor Day? Yeah, I think that, if I remember right, so they're doing these in, okay. in stretches here. We're in phase two by June at the latest, means phase three, August 1st. If, if, if no hiccups happen, means you would get to phase four by Labor Day. And in my mind, I've kind of viewed this always as a, how do we get to Labor Day conversation? I don't think in-person meetings happen until after Labor Day. And even then, uh, will people be want, will people A, have the, the budget to travel, but B, will they be prescripted and only going to events in their region or events on the other side of the state? Or yeah. are they able to travel inter domestically or internationally? I think there'll be a number of, I don't think we'll assume that once we get to phase four, it's fully back to business as normal. Uh, there along the way. Yeah, you know, that's a great, um, and I'm, I'm sure you have information on it, but but, but uh, the airline industry. And I was just thinking of, you know, uh, AWB meetings. And then, of course, we're in Western Economic Development Association. There's, you know, meetings that are planned for maybe later in the summer that we could drive to and maintain mm -hmm. social distancing, probably in that phase three. Uh, but airline travel, someplace we have to travel to for a meeting on an airline, you know, obviously with Boeing in our state, and then, you um, do you have any thoughts or, or ideas about how are we going to come out of this on the airline? And I might just put a plug in for next week's Coffee with Carl because we do have uh, the Pasco Airport Manager, Buck Taft, and our airline uh, advisor, uh, Jack, who are going to join us. And we will be talking about uh, locally about the airport in Pasco and then the airline industry in general. But what are your thoughts, Chris, on how do we come out of that or what does that look like? Or, or is there any discussion around what is the new normal of airline travel? I think a couple things. One, remember, we're, we're home to Alaska Airlines. Yeah. Uh, and Alaska Airlines serves really important communities like Pasco. Pas Pasco was the number two market it came into, but Yakima, Pasco, Trice, or um, I'm sorry, Wenatchee, Spokane, Pullman, uh, one time uh, Lewis and Clarkston, uh, Bellingham, Washington. It's a huge, huge uh, partner on a number of reasons. One, talk about freight. Right? How does freight get out? Most most freight goes in the belly of an airplane. Two about connecting us to our meetings or to our destinations of choice here. Uh, you know, I am all. I think we're all hopeful for the day where we can get back to jumping on a plane and, and going to see our loved ones or going to something uh, fun. That's that needs to be really important. We need to keep that in mind as we go forward. Uh, Tri Cities has been very fortunate to have a phenomenal air service. I mean, you could go to San Francisco and back for the day. You could go to you're in a uh, on target to have what a red eye to Chicago coming up it makes getting to the East Coast that much easier. Service to Minneapolis, down to Arizona. I mean, Tri Cities is really fortunate to have the, the great air service, and Tri Tech deserves some credit on that because you you lead the air service task force for the region. And so, uh, when I was there, I, I happened to sit on that task force and thought that was really important. You know, I wanted to share something about we're surveying about a thousand businesses every ten days. Uh, Carl, and, and here's some data that we have from the most recent survey. 90% uh, of respondents continue to have widespread economic challenges to their business. 82% have reduced revenue. And one third of the respondents are closed to comply with the stay home, stay safe order. 
the number of furloughs or layoffs has changed. It's gone from uh, it's gone down from 56% to 24%. That's probably a reflection of the PPP funding getting it getting down to local businesses and them having to maintain okay. employment levels. The concern though is permanent layoffs are up. They're up from 14% to 20%. On the good news side, a quarter, a quarter of respondents said it would take less than a week to reopen their business. So as you think about going to phase two and those phase deadlines, uh, a quarter said they could open in less than a week and 87% of respondents said they can open and operate safely with social distancing in mind, i.e. We, we can go to work and go home. Yeah, uh, that's what that data uh, bears out there. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I know we get your surveys and, and uh, I'm sure as all AWB members do. And that's great that you guys are doing that to really provide some some data so that as we all work together to say, how can we join forces to help businesses come out of this? You know, what what are those data and trends that we're trying to address with any program that we might be involved in? Um, just wanted to let you know through Facebook, we are getting a lot of questions about prioritizing phase four businesses to your point, just because they're the last ones that can open, don't know when they can open and probably, you know, are going to be impacted the hardest. So I think as we all work about, talk about those programs and work on them, uh, we are getting uh, questions and comments about being able to focus on helping them out. Um, got another one that comes up and we're down to about eight minutes. So here's a good one. What do you got? So I just want to say, I, I shared with you the breaking news. It's well, now go. live. So if you're somebody that's on here, if you go, you'll see Rebound and Recovery website. If you go to rebound, the word and recovery.org, that portal is now up. That's perfect. Breaking news for the Tri-Cities. That's awesome. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing it here first. I'm sure you already announced it, but we appreciate it. We have, actually, we're not going to announce it until Tuesday. Oh, wow. So uh, we're not going to do a big push until next week. We're going to do a quiet phase, let people go and uh, work through any kinks that might be in the website and all uh, over the weekend, but we'll do a big push starting Tuesday. That's awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Here's, here's our next question. Um, let's say in the next six months, as we go through these phases, as we all continue to work with businesses and even any federal, state, or local programs to help help businesses survive and then reopen safely, uh, what do you see as some critical things that we can all think about or focus on? Maybe from you know business organizations like ours or from business owners restarting. What are some critical um, things you see coming up in the next six months? Yeah, I, I think I would break it into a couple different buckets. One is certainly going to be access to capital and dollars for small business. Most small businesses have a loan, so the ability to to access uh, whether it's financing for equipment or to have loans for payroll. Uh, so I think financing is, is a key piece going along the way. One, two, the whole nature of changing workforce. And, and uh, most respondents in a prior survey said, hey, uh, my workforce is going to look different and the skills I'm going to need are going to look different down the road. Uh, again, that's why it's so important to have a partnership with Columbia Basin College and WSU on our workforce portal that we're going to pilot this summer, because I think there is going to be a different need of skill sets down the road. As we go along, you must have got an answer, by the way. Uh, the no, I, Ashley just texted you and I think a picture of Carl Adrian that he just sent to her. <laughs> if, I, if you've got I, your I phone, it's on. You just got a text. Carl, I haven't heard from you yet. Your, your answer is not showing up in the Q&A. <laughs> I'm really disappointed in you uh, here. So, uh, but, but I think so. So liquidity and financing are going to be really important uh, there, you know, a, along the way. Having the ability to access products and markets, produce, produce what they make, being able to serve their customers. Uh, pp and &E is going to be around for a while. So, for example, that toolkit that just went online just now does a great job of walking uh, all types of companies, but small business and Main Street companies through the, hey, what do I need to be thinking about as I think about reopening? What, what, you know, what type of markings do I need to have in my business? What type of social distancing do I need to have? How do I call my employees back? Do I do shift work? You know, this is probably going to be more transformative on the way we work than anything probably has been in the last 10, 15 years here along the way. Uh, and then we're going to need, we're going to need to get into the recovery mode. We're still in the reopening mode. And I think the recovery mode will be as, as important as reopening and as important as the crisis mode was. That was great. Maybe, uh, 
One more question, and this is something that we've talked about before when you joined us for the Economic Outlook Forum earlier this year. Um, we talked about it a little bit, but uh, we talked about ag, we talked about manufacturing, we talked about the supply chain, but but what about technology companies? You know, that's that's one that here in the Tri-Cities, obviously with the lab, uh, we've got such a base in technology research and, and you know, the future and in many different fields. But what do you see? And I think you kind of talked about it before, obviously broadband's a key component to it, but what do you see that are opportunities for communities like ours in this time of, you know, remote, even more remote working, yeah. maybe like help build on that technology cluster. And, and again, being Washington focused, and we know about the, you know, the uh, tech center that really is the Puget Sound and what a powerhouse that is, but got any thoughts or ideas about how can we, you know, help connect or position and, and, and attract, whether it's individual people and talent, or even it would be small, you know, uh, company sectors or something like that. Any ideas? Yeah, on the company side, I think there wouldn't be a community in the state that wishes they didn't have PNL there. I mean, think about the 5,000 men and women that work out of PNL, more PhDs per capita than anywhere in the world. Uh, this is a this is going to be a very strong economic engine for the future, not just the future of the Tri Cities, but for that matter, the future of the state of Washington. You know, I, I like to give Dr. Ashby a hard time that every time I go through an airport, I'm thinking of him as I got to put my hands up to get screened here, right? The amount of innovation that will come out of this next 10 year period of time is really going to be big. And a lot of that's going to play a really important role out of Pacific Northwest National Laboratory there. And so I, I think if there was a, there was a, a sector of an economy to ride around innovation and technology, uh, having PNL play an important role in that is huge. About. Uh, along the way and it's gonna it's gonna be a workforce play too to where your comment right they're gonna need a skilled trained educated workforce and they don't all need to be phds they're gonna need everything though from high school graduates to phds and everything in between to be a part of their workforce uh at pnnl and so i think we should feel great that we have a strong partner like we do in pnnl and that it's going to play an important role of, of driving innovation and technology along with wsu and uw uh, across our state so we have you know, a three-legged innovation technology stool along with the private sector. And then to know how much, how much funding is in the region and in the state from venture capitalists, mm -hmm. because uh, access to that funding is really, really important. And uh, you have a growing and stronger venture capital play in the Tri-Cities. There's certainly a strong venture capital play in the West Side. Uh, they're going to play an important role in, in funding innovation and technology going forward. Oh, that's great. A great answer. Well, I want to um, remind the audience of the website that you talked about, Chris, and you just showed on your phone, but it's reboundandrecovery.org, which is your portal that you guys have just gone live with today that gives small businesses access to the PPE and then also uh, resources for reopening from some of the safety um, gear and guidelines and those things. So we appreciate you announcing it today and we want to use that as a resource. I will say that, you know, we partner with our other business organizations here in the health district. And we're working on a similar measure. So we will definitely uh, use and, and push, you know, suggest the businesses go to your site too. And we appreciate the access to that resource. That's, that's really great. Chris, we're down to about a minute. Do you want to make a closing statement or give any shout outs to your friends here in the Tri-Cities? And I just want to thank you for your time this morning and join us. It's been a really good conversation. Well, thanks for having me. I think these are important conversations to have. You know, I would end with just saying, Carl, I hope your family's staying safe and healthy. I'd love to hear about them. Uh, you know, I think I'd be lying if our kids don't tell you that they have cabin fever. They're ready for the school year to be over. They're ready for mom to stop being Mrs. Johnson, the teacher, and just be mom. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we're all having to adapt in this period of time. But I hope, I hope you and your family are doing well. I hope all of my friends and family back in the Tri Cities are doing well. Well, thanks, Chris. We, we are doing well, and I hope the same uh, for your family. It's always great to get your Friday fives where I like at the end where you have a little blurb about what's going on with your family and the kids, especially uh, sporting events and stuff. And I really appreciate that. So, so thanks again for your time this morning. Thanks for the work that you and AWB uh, work on. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Go to work, go home. All right. Thanks a lot, Chris. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.